Welcome to the uh, Unit 2 uh, tutorial. Please have your study guide out. If you don't have the study guide yet, you need to pause this video, go to my ham Canvas home screen, click on the study guide button, and download the current study guide. Your choice, paper or digital, but you need to have a study guide. Okay, off we go. So let's start with the British laws that the uh, colonists didn't like. The proclamation of 1763, this is where we started the unit, right? The French and Indian War cost them a lot of money. Uh, the British were not um, very eager to go back to war with the Native Americans, so they draw a line down the Appalachian Mountains and say to the um, colonists they can't go west of that line, and of course the colonists don't want to listen to that because they had seen some of this fighting for the war, they were anxious to continue to expand westward, the population was growing, they were a uh, agrarian society, meaning they farmed and they needed more farmland. They knew that land west of the Appalachians was nice and uh, fertile soil for growing crops. So um, the Americans didn't want to be told what to do, the Native Americans didn't trust the Americans, the colonists, uh, so they started, the Americans started to resent the British crown for telling them what to do because they had enjoyed salutary neglect for 150 years, which basically means that the um, British crown let them uh, do what they needed to do and what they wanted to do as long as they continued to send their um, raw materials back to the homeland, everything was good until the French and Indian War. So then we get to the Stamp Act. Um, the war left Great Britain with huge debts. To raise money, Parliament passed the Stamp Act in 1765. Colonists protested the Stamp Act because it was passed without colonial representation. This is where we start to see the battle cry of no taxation without representation. The colonists also protested the Quartering Act. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but this caused the colonists to get the British attention by boycotting British goods. So then comes the Townsend Acts. Uh, Townsend was a, a parliament member who really wanted to punish the colonists, put them in their place. So they imposed more taxes on the colonies, which divided many colonists into opposing camps. The loyalists urged obedience to Great Britain, but the Patriots resisted taxation without representation through protests, boycotts, and riots. The Quartering Act required the colonies to house the British soldiers in barracks provided by the colonies. If the barracks were too small to house the soldiers, then local localities were to accommodate the soldiers in inns, uh, stables, bars, restaurants, and the houses of sellers of wine. And people did not like being told they had to house a complete stranger. Okay, writs of assistance I didn't talk about. Um, we took it off the test, but I just wanted to mention it because it will come back full circle to us when we get to the Bill of Rights. So the writs of assistance were court orders that authorized custom officers to conduct general non-specific searches of premises for con contraband, meaning illegal stuff. They didn't, it was like a warrant that they could just get, it was like knock on the door and be able to rifle through somebody's house looking for something illegal. Um, and it was like giving the soldiers carte blanche because it didn't have de it didn't have details, it didn't have a person's name on it, a date on it, or the location they, they had the right to search. So basically gave them the right to search anybody at any time that they felt like. As a response to the Boston Tea Party, Great Britain passes the Intolerable Acts. When the Patriots protested the tax on tea, Along come the Intolerable Acts, uh, forcing the colonies to give in to British. Uh, they were passed to force them to behave. The Patriots responded, responded by forming the first Continental Congress and organizing colonial militias. Now let's review some events. The Boston Tea Party, the Ed Tea Party, the Boston Massacre, and the Declaration of Independence, not necessarily in that order. So let's start with the first event, the Boston Massacre which started off as a confrontation between some rowdy uh, Bostonians and um, a soldier, a British soldier, that quickly escalated into a, uh, from a street brawl into a straight up um, chaotic, bloody slaughter um, with the British opening fire into a crowd of Bostonians. The event was used to energize anti-British settlement and pave the way for the American Revolution. 
The Boston Tea Party in 1773 on December the 16th, which is my birthday, as I always remember that. Um, the American colonists, frustrated and angry at Britain for imposing taxation without representation, dumped 342 chests of imported British tea into the harbor. The Boston Harbor has never been cleaned since. Um, the event was the first major act of defiance to British rule over the colonists. It showed Great Britain that the Americans were not going to be pushed around um, over taxation and tyranny, and they rallied the American patriots across the 13 colonies to fight for independence. The Edmonton Tea Party in North Carolina was a response to not only the Tea Act, but inspired by the Boston Tea Party. And it was 51 women led by Penelope, Penelope Barker in 1774. It was an agreement to give up tea and to boycott other British uh, products. And of course, the Declaration of Independence is our breakup letter to King George and England so that we are never, ever getting back together. Written by Thomas Jefferson and adopted by the Second Continental Congress, it states that the reasons the British colonies of North America sought independence in July of 1776, the king uh, interfered with the colonists' right to self-government and a fair judicial system. The war itself. Now, um, our standards don't require us to go into the details of the war, and because of the circumstances we're in right now, I really just don't have time to go in. You guys will do a much deeper dive of this in high school, um, you know, I apologize, I'm shortchanging a little bit, especially with the North Carolina stuff, but I'll try to see if I can give you guys some independent um, extension work if you're interested in some of the battles and stuff. But basically, let's boil it down to the essentials, was that the, the events causing the war and the aftermath of the war are what's really important to the eighth grade standards. But what are the advantages and the disadvantages the Americans and the British um, had in the war? We'll go over, um, again, the Declaration of Independence, the Halifax, and the Mecklenburg results. We'll talk about French involvement, Native tribe involvement, and the slogan, join or die. Um, economic items, including mercantilism and taxation without representation. And then I'm actually not going to go over the Treaty of Paris. We'll, we'll skip over that. Um, so what are some of the advantages and disadvantages the Americans and the British both had in the war? I have a flip flop. So, the British were unbeatable, the greatest army in the world at the time. The soldiers were well-fed, well-equipped, well-disciplined. Um, and um, most importantly, they had a Navy that could not be beat. They had the, uh, the ability to raise funds. And they uh, raised, they paid some mercenaries who were soldiers for hire from Germany to help them fight the Americans. Their main disadvantage was they were not fighting on their own turf, okay? The advantages of the Americans were they were fighting for a cause they passionately believed in for their rights, their independence, and their liberty. Um, their politi political leaders, however, were very inexperienced, but proved surprisingly competent. The war was expensive. They didn't have any money. Um, their soldiers were not paid. They were not well-dressed. Um, as you know, in Valley Forge, they were fighting with their feet wrapped in rags. Um, but the French came along and, and, and helped tip the scales in America's favor by not only financing them, but fighting with them to beat the British. Okay, MECDEC, we've already kind of talked about. It's that Declaration of Independence, um, May 20th, 1775, supposedly sent to Congress, but no original exists and uh, no reports exist from the reading of it. The Mecklenburg Resolves are thought to be the basis for the unproven MECDEC. Mech well, not a decoration. The Resolves annulled and vacated all laws and um, declared independence from England. And they were the first of many, as other colonies would follow. The Halifax Resolves, the first official government calling for independence from Great Britain as a state, copy was sent to the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia within weeks. Other colonies drafted similar resolves calling for independence. The French involvement, the native tribe involvement, and the slogan, join or die. Okay, so the French, again, came in. They, they were bitter en enemies. They had been beaten by the British in the French and Indian Wars. So they were also happy to only su um, supply weapons, such as gunpowder, cannons, clothing, and shoes, but also became an official ally of the United States. And Lafayette was, um, you know, Washington's right-hand man, he was a French um, officer who Washington actually saw as a son. 
the Native Americans, the, the colonists wanted to keep out of the war. Um, and of course, the Native Americans knew and saw the Patriots as a threat because they knew they were going to try to continue to encroach on their, their land. And so at the end of the day, they ended up um, fighting with the British um, against the colonists. Join or die, we looked at this in class. Um, oh, you can't see the cartoon, let me move this down. Is the snake that's all divided with the, uh, doesn't have all 13 colonies, but a political cartoon attributed to Benjamin Franklin appeared along with Franklin's editorial about the disunited state of the colonies and helped make his point about the importance of colonial unity and became a symbol of colonial freedom during the war. Okay, almost done. So economic items, uh, mercantilism, I have mentioned it a number of times. I did not go into great detail of it because you should have learned this last year, but it's an economic system that focused on growing a nation's wealth by exporting easily produced goods in exchange for limited imports. So something like timber or cotton would get sent back to, the, to England and then it would get turned into textiles or furniture or whatever it is that they were making with that thing and they would send it out onto the free market. These nations would then collect the raw materials to use in production, as I just said, as well as abund abundance of precious or luxury goods as like gold and silver. Defenders of mercantilism argue that the economic system created a stronger economy by marrying the concerns of colonies with those of the founding countries. To reinforce its mercantilist control, Great Britain pushed harder against the colonies, ultimately, ultimately resulting in the Revolutionary War. And that leads right to taxation without representation. The political slogan that originated from the American Revolution, the idea that it wasn't the taxes so much that they, that they didn't agree with, it was the fact that they did not have a voice in Parliament, in British Parliament, to be able to choose what and how much and when the taxes would be implemented. So since the colonists believed they were not represented, they thought that the acts were unconstitutional and were their denial of their rights as Englishmen. Okay, are you ready to take the practice test? You now slow down, there's no need to hurry through it. You can pause it. I have, it's a school net test embedded in Canvas. Um, go ahead, take your time, but once you're done and you have your test results, go through the test and look at the wrong answers and make sure you look at the right answer choices and make notations of it that will help you study. Okay, thank you so much.